Welcome to Numerical Methods. And this is the last session on our small excursion to computer arithmetic. So we introduced uh, the floating point numbers and it was defined in three parts and maybe the most important part are the normalized floating point numbers. And you see there was here this scale parameter on which scale we are. And then there is this part here, which somewhat encodes the value on that scale. Uh, and you saw that here the smallest step is one divided by two to the power of P. So depending on the scale, that is the relative step size. So we had this uh, little result that if we consider rounding, that we round to the nearest floating point number. So that is here the definition of these normalized floating point numbers. Uh, so we have some kind of rounding that rounds here to the nearest floating point number. Then we have the nice result that the relative error so the relative rounding error, relative because I multiply here with the absolute value of the number itself, at least if we stay in the normalized floating point numbers, so that was here this large, large region. So if you stay away from zero, staying away from zero, of course, otherwise the relative error wouldn't make sense. Yeah, then we have a bound on this relative error and this bound on this relative error is half because we round to the nearest floating point number, half this step size. So it's two to the power of minus P plus one, yeah? where P was this um, number of bits yeah, we used to encode this number. So we had this nice result that we have here the uh, relative error is bounded by this number. And we called this number, uh, say, machine epsilon. So this guy here is sometimes called e epsilon. So if we look at one plus epsilon, it's exactly the number that it's in between one and the next floating point number. We already observed that this rounding can lead to strange effects. Yeah? For example, if we look at the solution of a quadratic uh, equation, yeah? uh, then we can have strange effect that we actually do not get the right solution. And I would like to conclude the session with a very simple problem, namely that of calculating a sum. And uh, that will be quite important for us. Actually, my next section is the Monte Carlo method, where we will calculate a sum of a sequence of numbers, xi, and we calculate this where n is, say, very large. And already this trivial thing of calculating the sum can suffer from severe rounding errors. Okay, so in the Monte Carlo method, so that is a little bit motivation, which will be our next uh, chapter. So a frequent operation is to calculate the average of a discrete or numerically discretized random variable. So if I calculate the average, okay, that is just that here I'm dividing by n, yeah, but if calculating the sum has the problem, then also calculating the average has this problem. So the classical algorithm to do this yeah, looks like this. Yeah? We just calculate the sum, we divide by n, and we calculate the sum by just adding each element to a running 
variable running some variable. So we define here initially the sum to be zero. And then in every step, we say sum is the previous sum plus the value that we would like to add to the sum. So here this realization i, this is our xi. And this is here the sequence xi. So that is actually here the sequence xi and well, the computer would use the indices from zero to n minus one. Okay. And the length of the array is n, so I divide by n. Yeah? So that is here, divide the sum by n. And you would just implement this like that and looks harmless to me. Well, um, let's try a little experiment on that. So what could go wrong? So exercise, we calculate this sum, so one divided by n, and now, okay, there's a typo here, that is an i here, and now i runs from zero because I'm in the computer. Uh, sum uh, i from zero to n minus one xi. Uh, so let's calculate the sum using this classical algorithm, and we will use for the xi, so for the sequence, actually we will use always the same value. So all the xi's are say 0 0.1, you know, some value, but we will use um, a very large number of these. You know, so I believe that's 10 million. Yeah, so we will use 10 million times the xi and add it to the um, running sum. Well, of course, since this here is the average, I already know the solution. Yeah, I'm always summing the same value. So that should be just my C, that should be 0 0.1. Okay, so let's try this. So I go to the development environment and maybe here where we created our small experiments, I create a new one. And yeah, so I like to have a main method where I can try this out. And let's call this just summation experiment. Okay, so let's print the small headline as we usually do. So this is an experiment and it's maybe still related uh, to the loss of significance. And now with the example of summation. Okay, so let's define our number C. Yeah, so I just call this a value and then how many values do we like to add? So that is 10 million, one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, and so maybe we start just by with 10. Yeah? So let's try first 10. Um, and then calculate this uh, sum, yeah, or let's say the, the average. So let's first calculate the sum, the sum of the values using the classical algorithm. And I define this in some function. Okay, so the function should have two arguments. The first argument is the value and the second argument is the number of values. Okay, so once I have calculated the sum, I calculate the average. So the average calculating this classical method is just the sum that we calculated divided by the number of values. And then just print this out. Okay, so classical summation average, yeah, that is this value. So now he complains that, okay, he doesn't know this function and let's create it. 
So here's now my little code that calculates the sum. So I first start with initializing my running sum with zero, and then I loop over every element of my array. Here I don't have an array uh, of elements, so I just have the same value all the time. Um, and I do just what was on the slide. The new sum is the previous sum plus the value. Okay. And then I just return this guy. Okay, so I hope I did everything right. Yeah, looks correct. Maybe we try that out. Okay, so the output should be just C, yeah, because we are calculating the average of 10 million times the C, yeah, and uh, the C is 0.1, well, we get 0 0.099999, okay, that, that is more or less the C. Uh, well, but not exactly, no? there is somewhat an error in the last digit, yeah, so it should, why doesn't he output 0.1, which I would expect. So let's now increase the number of values we are adding to our sum. So let's use the 10 million. Okay, run the program again. And you suddenly see, okay, the error really gets larger. Yeah? And uh, 10 million is uh, 10 to the power of seven. Yeah? And we have here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven digits that are wrong. Huh? So somehow, if we take a very large number to sum up, yeah, we get really a large error. Uh, well, you might say, okay, still this is here at the end, yeah. But if you make it even larger, yeah, he will slowly eat into the result, and the error will become bigger and bigger. It is really a trivial, trivial thing. And look, we used double precision floating point numbers. So for the double precision floating point numbers, we use 64 bit. We have 52 bit for the P and our um, epsilon is a 10 to the um, minus 16. Yeah, so we have approximately 16 digits there. If we would use single precision floating point number, so maybe I just use single precision floating point number here in the summation. Yeah? So I use here float, okay? So then of course he complains here that I use here a double number, but I can just cast it to, to a float. Yeah? What happens if I do the summation on single precision floating point numbers? Okay, then the error is quite large. The error is, it should be 0.1, I get 0.108, yeah? So the error is already 8%. That's not trivial. So the only thing that was saving me a little bit was that I was using here double precision floating point numbers. But that's really a waste, yeah? Because uh, I lose all the precision. Okay. So if we compare then here the result of our numerical calculation to the analytic solution, we observe that there is a large error if you use this classical summation algorithm. There is a cure to this, yeah? And I would like to show you the Kahan summation algorithm. So while the error in the previous uh, classical algorithm is somewhat order of n, yeah? So you see the error was something like uh, seven digits if, if um, n was 10 to the power of seven, yeah? So it grows like the number of values grows. This algorithm has an error that is order one. So this means that the Kahan summation algorithm, if n is, not extremely large, yeah, but you will later see in a small theorem what that means. Then the error is order one. So that means the error is actually independent 
of the length of the array of the length of the sequence so of the length of the uh, summation yeah so the number of summits okay so what do we actually do so here is the algorithm that looks now maybe a bit more complicated but actually i just introduced a few more variables so let's go step by step through this algorithm we do the same as before so we initialize the sum to zero then there is an additional variable which i call error which i also initialize to zero so there is an additional variable error then i just take the value which i have to sum up which is my xi well, there's now minus error, uh, but error is zero. You can ignore that. And then I calculate the sum. So the new sum is the previous sum plus that value. And now I have another additional line, which I will explain in a second. But if you ignore this line, it's just that I set the sum to the new sum. And if you now look at all the red parts here, it's the classical algorithm, but I just introduced a little bit more variables. Yeah? So I introduced an additional variable here, value, and then I calculate an additional variable new sum, but then I set sum to new, new sum. So you could have just dropped this line and just write sum here. Yeah? That would be the same. Sum is sum plus value. So you see that the only modification is this green line. Okay, so this is what is added to the classical summation, the red part. So what am I calculating there? So what is actually the problem with calculating the sum? Well, 0 0.1 is a small value, but if I take 10 million times 0 0.1, it is 1 million. It is a large value. So that means the sum is becoming large and I'm adding small values to it. So the problem of the summation is actually this line here. So I have a large value sum and I'm adding a small value. So this is like a one plus epsilon. And we understood that the one plus epsilon has issues you know, because we can have this rounding error. So this green additional line is actually checking if this operation was successful because I take the new sum and then I subtract the previous one. So and that's the reason why I need a new variable because I have to remind me what was the previous sum variable of the running sum. So, and if I subtract these two, then I know that this here should be just value if this operation was successful. Yeah? So mathematically, this is just value. Yeah? Then I subtract the value if the operation would have been successful, that would be just a zero. Otherwise, I keep track of this error. So if error is negative, maybe I add this here as a small remark, then the new sum is too small. So something is missing. And the stuff that is missing is just added to the value in the next loop. So that is now another thing that comes into addition. It is that
I add the stuff that is missing. So if error is smaller than zero, then minus error is the stuff that is missing. And I add this to the value. So I add this to the next value. Well, and value is a small number. So maybe error is small, value is small, everything is fine. So let's try this out. So I just do now the same stuff here again but with a new function that uses the Kahan summation. So let's have here sum of values, say Kahan, get sum of values. Kahan, I provide the value and the number of values he should add. But then I calculate the average. So that is just the sum divided by the number of values. And I just print the result. So he complains he doesn't know this function. So let's create this method. Yeah, maybe I just can copy here my other algorithm and I just modify the algorithm to do the error correction. So I need, in addition to the running sum, a running error. The first thing is that I need to calculate the new value as the value, but with the previous error correction. At the first loop, this is just zero. So then we calculate the new sum. So the new sum is now the previous sum plus the new value, which is the error corrected value. And then I remember the error. So the error is the new sum minus the sum minus the new value. Yeah. So if this operation here would be su successful, then this difference here would be just new value and uh, the error would be zero. Okay, and then the sum is just this new sum. So that should be now the Kahan summation. Okay, and maybe I can do it as before. We start with just 10 values and we let it run. Okay, and you see, I get a perfect 0.1 now. Yeah? So actually that here was not just something he couldn't really display. It already had an error inside. Let's use the 10 million. Okay, and the error stays away from us. Okay, we can also move to the floating point uh, numbers. Yeah, So I could change here everything to float, but it's maybe also sufficient just to change the summation to float. So then he complains here because that should initialize to a single position number. And that's now also a single position number. And I also change here everything to a floating point number. So then he complains here about the initialization. And of course, the value which enters here as a double, 0 0.1 double is 0 0.1 in float. So I just cast this value. Okay, so now I have a single position summation uh, algorithm. So one is using uh, Kahan and the other one is using classical. Yeah? And you see there's a huge difference. Yeah, There's an 8% error here and there's no error there. Okay, so. Since we usually use double precision numbers, I keep it that way. And actually we will use the Kahan summation when we lo will look at uh, 
calculating a, a random variable. So later we will look into our mathematical finance uh, library here and uh, somewhere below here, there's uh, Monte Carlo and there's a, a random variable here. And this random variable is a little bit like what you saw. There is an array, a huge array here of realization. And when you now search for the method that calculates the expectation or the average, you will see that he's actually exactly using this summation algorithm. And many algorithms that perform summations already have this built in. And nice example that you have to be aware of this. Uh, maybe we go step by step uh, through the algorithm again to see what is going on. So let's consider a nice little um, example here. So my example for the Kahan summation, I consider now, uh, say, a sequence where I already start with a number that is a bit larger because then we will see from the start what's going on. So my secret sequence starts with x0 is equal to one and all the other xi's are equal to epsilon. Yeah? So that's actually the sequence I would like to sum. Uh, <clears throat> so what's going on? So the issue of my program is, so now this is exactly the epsilon being the machine precision. So the issue is that I know that one plus epsilon rounded is one but one plus two epsilon is a floating point number. So one plus two epsilon rounded is one plus two epsilon. Uh, so maybe that here is uh, a nice guy. Yeah? So maybe I make that one green. Okay, so let's go step by step through the algorithm. Uh, we initialize the sum to zero. So we start here with a sum that is zero. And uh, the first line is that we take the value from the array. Uh, so actually here I also introduced value and new value. Yeah. Uh, so that was actually not here. Yeah. So here I just had value is already the error corrected value. Because now then I can explain a little bit better to you what's happening here. So I'm adding value. So then I calculate the new value. So the new value is calculated here from the value and the previous error. So the previous error is also initialized to zero. So that is just the value plus zero is one. Then in the next step, I calculate the sum. So the new sum is calculated here and the new sum is the previous sum. So the previous sum is zero plus the new value, which is one. So one plus zero is one, that's okay. And then I calculate the error. So the error is calculated here. So the error is the difference of the new sum and the previous sum. So that guy minus that guy, one minus zero is one. And then I subtract the new value. So one minus one is zero. So the error is zero. And I then just copy the new sum to the sum. So sum is just the new sum. So I just take that, yeah? So that one is copied over there. And that's also the value I use as a starting value for the next iteration. Okay, so I start the next iteration. Yeah, here, everything was fine. Yeah? So let's see what happens in the next iteration. So in the next iteration, I take the value. Yeah? So that's this guy here the epsilon, and then I calculate the new value. So the new value is this epsilon. So the new value is calculated by taking value minus the previous error. So I take here the value, which is the epsilon, minus the previous error. The previous error was 
zero. Okay, so it's one minus zero, it's an epsilon. So then I calculate the new sum. So the sum is the previous sum. So that's the new sum is calculated taking the previous sum, which is here the one plus the new value, which is the epsilon. And we see we get a problem because now the one plus epsilon is one. So here I get this problem, one plus epsilon is equal to one. Okay, so my new sum is one, it should be one plus epsilon. So next one is calculate the error. So take the difference of new sum and the previous sum. So I have here the error is the difference of the new sum and the previous sum. The previous sum is one, the new sum is one. Yeah, and then I subtract the new value, which is this guy, which was the epsilon minus epsilon is a minus epsilon. So you see that we get here the error minus epsilon and epsilon is missing in the sum. Yeah, then I just update again the sum, which is just copy the value from the new sum. And I just start with this value in the next row. And okay, let's complete the next row because then you will see that suddenly the error will be contributing. So we start again here, take our value. Our value is an epsilon. So calculate now the new value. The new value is here the blue guy, whoops. So the new value is here, the blue guy. So we calculate value minus the previous error. So the value is an epsilon, that guy, but the previous error is a minus epsilon. So value minus error is actually two epsilon. So now you see that this operation here is running on the small scale. Yeah? So this, thing here is operating on small values. And since we are speaking of relative errors, yeah, relative errors on small values are small absolute errors. Yeah, that's the advantage. So now my new value is a two epsilon. Yeah, and I calculate now the new sum is the previous sum plus the new value. So we go here to calculate the new sum, which is now take the previous sum, the one, and now take the two epsilon to calculate one plus two epsilon. And if we now compare this new sum to the previous sum, we see the difference is two epsilon. If we subtract the value two epsilon, we see that we get an error of zero. Uh, so all the amounts are consumed by the summation and the error is zero again. So that zero here is to complete the drawing, take the new sum minus the sum is a one and minus the new value is a zero. Okay, and now you just copy this new sum again. So taking this new sum and you just copy it again in the sum. Yeah, and that's the value where you start the next loop. And you see actually what is happening here nicely. So every second step, we miss a little bit. We miss the epsilon, yeah? but every other step, we have a large enough value to actually consume it into the sum. And you see that this result here is going a little bit in steps of two, yeah? one, one, one plus two epsilon, one plus two epsilon, one plus four epsilon, one plus four epsilon. It should be one plus zero epsilon, one epsilon, two epsilon, three epsilon, four epsilon, five epsilon. And you see in every step, we either have no error or an error of epsilon. 
And it's independent of the number of summations we perform. It's either epsilon or zero. A very, very nice algorithm, yeah? Very simple, small modification. So this is a, a small theorem. So let's um, XI denote a sequence of floating point numbers. So speaking here of um, an implementation, this means XI is this array realization I, and N is then the length of this array. So like in listing one, yeah, which is the classical one or listing two, which is the Kahan summation. So let S denote the sum that we calculate. Then using the classical algorithm, we see that the S, yeah, which is the sum that we are calculating in the computer. Yeah? So this here is the thing that we calculate in the computer. So that is the variable sum. This is not equal to sum i from zero to n minus one xi. It is equal to something that is multiplied with an error. error. So we have that the sum s is the sum xi, every xi multiplied with a one plus delta i. And this one plus delta i has only a bound that depends on n. Uh, okay, so the bound gets smaller, but if you take here, say, some average value, yeah, an average value would be something like n times n times epsilon, yeah, so n, n half times two times epsilon. Yeah, so you see, if I would take that average value, then I can move this here in front, and you see that the sum, the error of the sum grows as n becomes larger. Uh, using the Kahan summation, so the algorithm in the second listing, uh, you have here a similar form. There is also an error, one plus delta i multiplied to every element. Yeah? Uh, but this error is just bounded by two epsilon. So if you take the bound, yeah, to epsilon and move it in front, you see that the error of the whole sum, the relative error of the whole sum is just two epsilon. Uh, there is a little bit additional term here that actually has an order n, but note that there is here an epsilon squared. Yeah, So this is very small uh, if n is not too large, yeah? So uh, we still would have an order epsilon uh, if n would be a 10 to the power of 16, which is a huge number and your computer will run quite, quite a long time to do this, yeah? So my claim was not 100% correct that it's order one, but it's actually order one in the case of say reasonable applications. Uh, I do not have a proof for the second part in the script. You can use uh, this reference here. So for a full proof, please see this article in the references. But I just want to prove the first part uh, because you have maybe now an intuition why Kahan works nicely. But from this year, from this proof for the first part, you also get the intuition, what is going wrong in the classical summation. So I just proved the first part that the classical summation has this bound, yeah? So actually, we actually should also show in an example that it grows like this bound, yeah? but uh, that you can prove this bound that is order n. So how is that done? So let SI denote the floating point number being the result after the i's summation. So the SI here is the floating point number, so the running sum. So it means it's not the true mathematical sum, it's the implementation. Yeah? So note that is here a float. So this is the 
true mathematical value, then we know we have exact rounding. So the worst thing that can happen is that we are rounded to the next floating point number. So SI is float times SI minus one plus XI. So that means I know the relative error of SI. So SI is the true mathematical value, though the true medical, medical value would be SI minus one plus XI. So that is the true value. And SI differs by this with a relative error due to rounding delta i, yeah, let's call it delta i tilde because I will remain, rename it a little bit. And the delta i is absolute value bounded by our epsilon. So that is our result uh, on the relative error of floating point numbers. So that's the floating point number. So then if you look here in, into this formula, uh, here in this sum, this is the sum of the previous value. There is of course um, an xj in this sum. Yeah? So the xj, the previous values have already been summed up. Yeah? So somewhere inside here, there is also an xj for a fixed j. So, and you see that what is happening here is that this xj is multiplied with the delta i tilde. In every step for the next i, it's multiplied with the delta i plus one and so on. So for the previous one, it was multiplied with the delta i tilde minus one and so on. So for this xj, we have that it is multiplied by all those fact factors, yeah? So in every summation factor, it gets this uh, additional relative error. So in one plus delta K tilde for K from J plus one. So in the next step, it gets, it gets uh, an, its error to I. Uh, and also because the XJ is here initially, it's multiplied with the delta J tilde plus one. So this runs from J to I. So you see that in this sum, I could also say that what we are doing is we sum up all the values And every guy gets a product of all those errors. From I, so when it's entering the sum until the final sum, the final result. The, um, the capital N minus one here. So you see that the errors are actually accumulating because I can think of an error in the I's operation that I distributed to, because it is a relative error, I distributed the factor to every element in my sum. So that's actually the representation of the final sum. This is the representation of the final sum that is implemented in the computer. So it is the final sum, including the errors. So assume all these guys here were the same, say for example, an epsilon, then actually what you have there is an one plus epsilon to the power of, and then, then how many guys do you have in this product? It runs from I to N minus one. Yeah, so it is an N minus I. So actually, if that would be the delta 
tilde k would be the epsilon, then the guy that you see there is actually a one plus epsilon to the power of n minus i. So if I now call this product that you see there, so I call this product here, uh, say one plus delta i, it's the error factor that is applied to the x i. If I call this, then uh, I can estimate my one plus delta i. Okay, so now there is an estimate for one plus epsilon to the power of n minus i. So there is an estimate for one plus a to the power of n. This is smaller than one plus two times n times a if n times a is small. Uh, okay, our n is large, but our a is the epsilon is small. Uh, so as long as the n, which is a 10 to the power of seven or 10 to the power of eight, yeah, millions, yeah, is smaller than the epsilon, which is a 10 to the mi minus 16, then we can use here this estimate so, and I have to estimate that one plus epsilon to the power of n minus i is smaller than one plus two n minus i um, epsilon. So we get this result and you see that we have here this accumulation. Yeah, so there is here the n and the accumulation actually comes from this part here that every, every guy in my summation is getting in every summation step, this relative error, because it is relative, it's multiplying to all the previous parts of the summation. So that's then the order n error propagation for the classical algorithm. So that was here our little exercise. Yeah, we already did this. So we already implemented this for some values. And we also used a uh, float and instead of double, you find this code session here in our repository. So this is called here summation experiment in the package here on computer arithmetics. And maybe you can play a little bit with this. And this concludes then our session on computer arithmetic, which I believe is quite important. Uh, you maybe might have a look to this article here where you also find the proof of the Kahan summation and other nice um, example you know, um, on this. Okay, maybe I would like to conclude with a, with a last remark. Uh, you saw that the issue came from adding a small value to the large, to a large value. And um, well, maybe you think, okay, the error is still small, yeah, and that it doesn't bother you. But we will later see that small errors make a huge difference if we look, for example, to approximate finite differences. So a finite difference to approximate a derivative, you maybe remember this, yeah? you can approximate this by f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. So now if, for example, one of these guys has an error, then if you now apply the finite difference and you divide here by the h, yeah, you divide by a small number, so you make the whole error much larger, so the error can become uh, very large. And this summation introduces such an error if you add a small number to a large number. And this uh, maybe rings another bell. The order in which you sum up values makes a difference. So for example, it's better to sum up the values 
in the order of their size. So you first sum up the small values to get a larger sum, and you, then you sum up the larger values. So it's maybe, a, maybe better to sum up the values in a specific order, if you do not use error correction, and the order may make a difference. Yeah? If you have values with huge differences yeah, and in, in, in magnitude, yeah, uh, and then sum up a small value to a large value, then this can give you different results for the sum, depending on which order you use. So you have, really have to be careful and we will see maybe this example. Yeah, that was it for my session on computer arithmetic. I hope you liked it. And uh, we will see such uh, problems in some applications later.